Well, I can remain here this afternoon. This year's um, lecture series as, uh, is the second year that we're offering this special uh, series on the exploration of the Catholic intellectual tradition in design and engineering. In honor of Father Edmund Bellamy, I want to say he's the former president of Illinois University. Father Bellamy, who died last year, uh, was one of those theologians who encouraged dialogue and envisioned the university as the place where the church continues to do its thing, much as Father Vesper uh, pointed out years before. Today we are grateful for Professor Vincent McCarthy and his presentation on Augustine and Kierkegaard. Dr. McCarthy received his PhD from Stanford University in Religion and Philosophy and is Professor of Philosophy at St. Joseph's University in New York Small School. Uh, where he also served as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and Provost. He studied at Union Theological Seminary, Fordham University, did uh, an MA in Classics, also my alma mater, at Yale University, University of Paris, where he was a fellow of French Foreign Ministry, and the University of Copenhagen, so Marshall Club. He was a Fulbright Senior Scholar in has been a guest professor at Yale University and the University of Pennsylvania. His specialties include 19th century philosophy, religious thought and culture, and is published widely in these areas. In addition, Dr. McCarthy joined the faculty of the Curtis Institute of Music in 2005. He's a linguist who speaks uh, 10 languages. He's a Curtis wide experience in administration. It almost seems like maybe he needs a form of the future. His publications include The Phenomenology of Moods and Kierkegaard, Quest for a Philosophical Jesus, Christianity and Philosophy and the Soul, April and Sharon, and the International Kierkegaard Commentary. And of course, his most recent work is Kierkegaard as Psychologist. We warmly welcome uh, Vincent, who's a friend of many of us and from Boulder, to share his thoughts and reflections with us. He started out with 7,000 word essay that he worked on. He's been so old for that. So, you are. We thank you. Even if only known nowadays in elite corners of elite universities. 
course, properly, what we should be talking about really is how to see this, and so then Kubrick is a lot of stuff that's important. Here at the Lower University, the name of Augustine is, of course, virtually compulsory. Why get on in Kierkegaard? Well, for one thing, he's really quite Augustinian in a 19th century form rather than the original 4th century version. And so a look at him in comparison with the original Augustine might be suggestive about what a later century Augustine might sound like might even offer some suggestion for the same themes in the increasingly secular contemporary world. So my problem looking at this is not just for the sake of intellectual history, but what about this topic, that, or some of the topics we're talking about in the year 2015. So the task today is to attempt a brief look at the themes of them both, and to try and discern and understand what each of them, in his own distinct way, in his own distinct time and culture, was trying to get at. And then to ask the question, how can and should we try to talk about the same topics in the year 2015 and beyond? What would be Augustine and Kierkegaard's reaction to each other? And then how seriously should we take it? For neither of them would have been inhibited by any preceding great names in the history of Christian or secular thought. So why should we? Okay. Uh, what would, uh, and then what are the possible and necessary differences between their approaches and ours? In short, we should try to appreciate their important insights, but not presume that they have or have the last word in any subject, including the one that I propose to focus on. What is that subject? Well, in Kierkegaard's terminology, it's inwardness. And he would be the first to admit that it was already becoming a hollow, used-up term in the early 19th century. The principal term that he used is still around, namely the self. But it is getting worded down in our own time. That term, uh, nowadays, is watered down into a term called the selfie. Okay? Such that a joke was recently on the internet that defined the self as the subject of a selfie. There is a sad truth in this joke. The selfie has perhaps become more important in our times than the self. Okay? We all, or at least most of us, know what a selfie is nowadays, but do we know what a self is? And while we know what we do with the selfie, maybe you send it on to someone else, we don't quite know what to do with the self. It's also easy to make a selfie, but how do you, how do you make a self? For a real self is actually much more than merely the subject of a selfie. Okay? And with one question further, and if you get a self, what do you do with it? Kierkegaard was most certainly aware of Augustine and his monumental role in the Western Christian tradition. His access was primarily through his own Lutheran tradition, which still had many points in common with the Roman Catholic tradition. How much did Kierkegaard know of Augustine's works directly? An interesting question, and the answer is becoming clear nowadays on the basis of some detective research on the part of the psychology in the Pennsylvania area. Okay. It's an interesting question, and it would be astonishing to think that someone so well traveled in the intellectual tradition, both in its intellectual oases and its intellectual deserts, would not have made a stop at Augustine as well. Indirectly, Kierkegaard was exposed to Augustinian thought in the Augustinian Lutheran theological tradition in which he was steeped. Augustine was referred to regularly in the theological lectures that Kierkegaard attended as a theology student at the University of Copenhagen in the late 1830s. And he comments on the ideas of Augustine in his journals based on lectures and theological texts of others, but not the texts of Augustine. He gives very little indication of having encountered Augustine directly, although his library did contain a Latin edition of the complete works of Augustine. But those of us who are professors probably have a lot of collected works, not all of which we've read. You know, uh, we go into my office and so I've actually read all those books. Well, you don't have quite the heart to say no. But one holds good parts of it, at, at least. Okay. So, most surprisingly, he gives us no indication of real familiarity with the confessions, although this is the work that has the strongest parallels with his own personal search and his own major themes. When one reads Kierkegaard's, sometimes one thinks that he must have read the confessions, but he appears that he may not have. At this point, let me here interject a common sense observation, but one crucial to understanding both Augustine and Kierkegaard. In my mind. They were each members of their times and of their cultures, heavily influenced by cultural ideas and cultural ideals, as well as the sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit cultural definitions of respectability, success, and human fulfillment. 
Each of them tend to reject the values of this particular time, in large part, but only after having tried them out in experience, in the same way that we find ourselves in the work having done. Augustine then abandoned his career as a professor of rhetoric, and Kierkegaard ultimately abandoned any thoughts of an academic career or else an ecclesiastical career. Most importantly, Kierkegaard, like Augustine, at least the Augustine of the Confessions, privileges experience over theology and is interested in probing human experience in its fullness and in its emptiness for clues and for direction. In his journals, Kierkegaard actually takes the theological Augustine to task for being too concerned about doctrine and the fine points of doctrine and seeming to privilege them over the more important things about Christianity. That's, of course, to take Augustine out of context. He had a very good reason for what he was doing in historical context. The works in which Kierkegaard pursues this enterprise are published literary works, but often based heavily on personal journal entries. As such, Kierkegaard never tells direct, never directly narrates his personal journal. Careful students of Augustine's Confessions have to ask how much of this is also true about Augustine, whose great work seems deeply personal, which it is, which at the same time is a consummate work of literature, hardly a memoir, but rather a work with a purpose on the part of a new church overseer of a minority sect in the secondary city of North Africa. This young man presented in the Confessions was not yet the impressive Augustine of medieval stained glass, but an even more interesting and struggling human being named Aurelius Augustinus. Even less was he the quote unquote great sinner who became a great saint. We'll leave the second part alone, but really observe that while he certainly seems to have suffered mightily and increasingly in the years before his conversion experience, with memories of failures and minor misdeeds. His literary self-castigations can mislead us into missing the fact that he was really a rather admirable human being, even at that time, even in his common law marriage and his relationship to his son. The young university student Kierkegaard in the 1830s was far more vain, lived the life of a rich man's son, and initially swung back and forth between seeking a church position and making a splash in the literary world. Because this is an audience that I presume knows this Augustine well, and particularly the Confessions, and in the interest of time, instead of reviewing the confession step by step, I would like instead to concentrate on elements in Kierkegaard that seem to echo Augustine, or have resonance, uh, or that discuss very similar themes, very similar spiritual disease, indeed disease, okay? and very similar and very and, and the very singular uh, and similar possible cure for that disease. Aurelius Augustinus would recognize in Kierkegaard's young esthetes, characters that he portrays in of his books in the 1840s, uh, elements that were present in the young Augustine himself. But one can look forward as well as backward, and Kierkegaard's 19th century poets and spiritual patients, often modeled on himself, have their counterparts today in the fashionable culture of sensitivity and self-actualization that constitute the new romanticism that began in California by degrees of the East, and by extension, contemporary American culture. Kierkegaard, of course, knew nothing of sensitivity groups, self-fulfillment groups, and the like. The 19th century Denmark and Germany had their cultural equivalents. Kierkegaard fully granted the alienation that such groups pointed to and agreed about the self-alienated quality of modern society. But having experimented himself with the alternative life views celebrated by such groups, he came up against their limit and came to regard proposed new cures as even worse than the disease. Worse, since they didn't cure the disease, but had the effect of either distracting people from it or, uh, or driving one further away from one's own self in a kind of spiritual attempt at suicide that Kierkegaard would come to analyze under the term despair. What Kierkegaard criticizes in modernity, on the one hand, the overconfidence of the scientific worldview that was still on the ascent of the 19th century, and on the other hand, the the fanciful notion that moderns, by virtue of their increased knowledge and mastery of the planet, are somehow essentially different from the human species in ages past. This he thought was just total nonsense. The consequence of a fanciful notion of a new humanity was that moderns began to believe that by experimenting with themselves and with society, they could radically and essentially change things and change themselves. Kierkegaard held this to be dangerous nonsense. He was a harsh critic of what he called bourgeois Danish society, and equally of self-designated reformers whom he viewed as dangerously superficial. He also stands against the self-proclaimed individualists in the excessive new climate of individualism, the 
poets, the literati, the intellectuals, and the esthetes of every stripe who set themselves up as models of modern self fulfillment. Kierkegaard mm -hmm. recognized that Malaise of his age was at root a very old malady indeed, that modern disease revealed a spiritual disease that he would analyze in depth in a book called The Sickness Unto Death. He also increasingly came to believe that the truest modern medicine for the human spirit was really a very old one, and recognized that this would be very hard swallowing for an age that considered the past as surpassing. Kierkegaard was all for a break with the ling lingering naive optimism of the Enlightenment and subsequent romanticism in order to point out, point to the humbling truth of humanity circumscribed not only by nature, but also by its own deeds of self impairment he knew, too, that he was breaking with the modern notion of history and of historical social progress for the sake of the higher history of the individual soul. Indeed, Kierkegaard saw that the essence of the fall from a, from a transcendent calling was not so much a matter of distant ancient history as it was forever new and recurring. Distracting contemporaries from this were the poets and the would-be geniuses of his age with their seductive image of sensitivity and creative suffering frequently disguising a diabolical willfulness and concealing a personal inner health. In Kierkegaard's view, the poets and intellectuals too, the cultural heroes of the 19th century, were seducing the age by celebrating feeling and imagination, by holding up various attractive visions of the imaginary self. The young Kierkegaard had made his own personal experiments and then reverted to unglamorous older ways described in such outdated terms as sin, and forgiveness. But having caught himself in time, as he thought, he could not rest content to let the age go the path it seems to have sketched for itself. For he saw clearly that the imaginary new self, so celebrated by his age, could never be actualized, and that those who pursued such fancies of the imagination never moved a step closer to overcoming the self-alienation that had been their starting point to begin with. In the process, Kierkegaard disputed and sometimes mock the analyses and cures offered by the informal psychologists of his time, the poets and the novelists, the philosophers, and even the Christian clergy. In his view, the root problem was that of a human being come to peace, coming to peace with itself and with its ground. And this was not a matter of poetry or sheer feeling or lofty theological concepts. What was needed in his view was a timeless cure, based on a correct understanding of the eternal template of the self in relationship to its eternal ground, and yet pointing in a surprising way to the inevitably unique individual quality of every such God relationship. Okay, so the real emphasis in Kierkegaard is certainly something that's very much common, but the relationship is he thought that each individual had with God was in the end utterly unique. Okay. Uh, in a section of Kierkegaard's early masterpiece called The War, a section of aphorism called the Diasalmata revealed a despairing individual who was a burden to himself, who felt empty and trapped, without hope, without any way out. Kierkegaard claims in the introduction to, this, uh, to his famous work on despair that any university student could have written his book called The Sickness Unto Death. I guess if anyone's ever opened it, uh, this is a bad joke. But the contemporary university student often prematurely despairs of understanding the work as a whole because of the first paragraph's arresting but confusing definition of the self, something when I was an undergraduate, I used to memorize it and used to recite as a joke. And here it is. What is the self? The self is a relation that relates itself to itself, or it is the relations relating itself to itself in the relation. The self is not the relation, but is the relations relating itself to itself. Recite that. Comedy Center or coffee to somebody or watch them sleep. So, so while he begins by defining the self as relationship, what is most striking, but not always obvious, is that the first relation mentioned is relationship to one's own self. This is not what we normally think of when we first think of relationship. Instead, we think of relationship to others. However, in proceeding in this manner, Kierkegaard is not proposing some kind of solipsism, but rather a corrective an alternative and ultimately complementary perspective to the outer, inner-oriented culture of his time and ours. Relationship is not just about the eternal, and it's not just about the other, although it is about the external, and it is about the other. It is emphatically also inner, for there is a way of relating to itself, 
and it is different from the relating to other cells in one's outer life. The work thus highlights problems in this inner relationship to oneself. And this relationship to oneself and one's inner life is fundamentally what constitutes the definition of despair, okay, including this aspect, relationship to the God and grounds the relationship. Okay. Religiously understood, the misrelationship is reflected in an absent or ruptured relationship to God. And it is manifested psychologically above all that is split will, another major Augustinian theme. A will that wills two things and tortures itself in an ongoing battle of these two wills and reveals the possibility on the part of those who wish to bring it to conclusion of achieving a purity of heart that wills one thing. Kierkegaard's insight aims to highlight experiential indications of the non-unity that one currently is. The fact that a person is always, to some extent, not yet who she or he truly is. That the self is a dynamism, that one must direct toward that which is greater than oneself and, and toward that which grounds the self, namely the transcendent, sin, and the theology of God. To understand the varieties of being a non-self versus the simplicity of being an authentic self, Kierkegaard's pseudonym in this book, in, in Limitless, presents the reader with an abstract category, cataloging of the manifold ways of being a not-self. The underlying point in his analysis of opposites is that what he calls despair is an imbalance caused by a misrelationship to one's ground and resulting in misrelationship to oneself. Despite the abstract language, the work tries to point the reader toward an understanding of what the misrelationship to oneself is all about, while theologically asserting that no final cure can arise without correcting the misrelationship to what he calls the grounding power or God as expressed in traditional Christian thought. The seriousness of the work on its own terms lies not only in its analysis, but also in directing the reader to do something about it, okay, Christianly understood. Okay. Um, that's why he says in his book, this book could be written by students who still have their feet on the ground and in touch with reality, whereas a professor couldn't possibly write this book professors have their, their heads in the clouds and the feet floating six inches off the ground. Much like that famous image of Socrates in, in Aristophanes' play, The Clouds. While Kierkegaard posits a universally applicable cure, he stresses the individual nature and destiny of each self. The individual nature and destiny of each self, as well as the individual nature of each person's relationship to the grounded power of God. In his view, it is not at all the case that we all become the same self. Each self is radically individual. And to the extent that there is a felt relationship to God, it will also not be identical for each. The rich religious implication here is that each individual's relationship to God is indeed individual. It is not identical to Abraham's relationship to God, or to Jesus' relationship to his father, or to any Christian saint's relationship to Jesus. It will be uniquely one's own, even if it shares essential aspects of the experience of others. Kierkegaard thus gives new meaning to the phrase, quote unquote, being alone with God. There is thus an implicit existential richness here in Kierkegaard's analysis that can sometimes be overlooked in the emphasis on forgiveness and grace. Sin, sin remained a major interpretive category in Kierkegaard's thinking as well as its theological category, grace. Kierkegaard accepts the tenets of traditional Christian theology as facts and interprets the human condition filtered through them. He accepted the biblical story of the fall of Adam and Eve and the theological interpretation of it that crystallized in the theology of Augustine, namely as constituting an original and inherited sin, even if he added a modern existential twist. Kierkegaard's solution to the bad faith of despair remains the experience of the ancient faith of Christianity. That is the experience of a God who offers forgiveness, salvation, and grace. But not just talking about it, but actually experiencing it. For modern secular readers of Kierkegaard, the notion of grace, or a supplement to human effort, is more problematic than the notion of sin itself. Sin, at least, had been successfully secularized by Kant in his famous book, Religion, within the bounds of reason alone, with its notion of a fall into radical evil, and was further secularized by Heidegger in his concept of Dasein's, uh, in German, Verfallenheit, 
or followers as a starting point uh, rather than as a, a, from which the human person must extricate himself or herself. Kierkegaard's conceptual embrace of grace is not a description of, of a phenomenologically grounded need, but rather the solution offered to him by Christian theology and to which he subscribes, and which he would no doubt assert conforms to his own experience. It is a sincerely held belief on Kierkegaard's part, but to some extent it seems like an arbitrarily added element without any demonstration or proof. If one had the opportunity to ask Kierkegaard to describe a concrete historical individual of Christian faith who has overcome despair, he would likely respond that he has no access to the inward life of another. Heidegger actually does no differently in his own analysis of fallenness and authenticity in being in time, nearly 100 years later. It is, of course, much easier to think of describing historical non-selves, and here there is a great abundance, both Christian and non-Christian. However, for, the, for this commentator, there's no reason to think that important non-Christian individuals, such as Socrates and Gautamus and Arta, should be regarded as having been in despair at the conclusion of their own lives. Okay. Um, in a certain sense, this observation is unfair to Kierkegaard, who was addressing his work only to contemporary and a professing Christian audience, so that they would understand and do something about their own despair along the lines outlined by their Christian faith, or their supposed Christian faith. But if it is unfair to Kierkegaard to raise the question of authentic selfhood achieved outside Christianity, it is by no means an unfair question in and of itself, nor an irrelevant one, for anyone who is interested in the possible psychological truth about overcoming the split in the self that Kierkegaard so otherwise so insightfully sketches. Is there then a model of authentic selfhood that does not require being articulated in the categories of Christian theology? Can one successfully substitute the language of being, or ground of being, as used by Heidegger and, and Tillich, for Kierkegaard's term constituted power? Can one speak meaningfully in a promising manner about a model of becoming a self where the self is relating to a felt sense of the transcendent? that is not visualized or conceptualized in Christian images. In thinking about such questions, one is ultimately obliged to pass beyond Kierkegaard. One cannot, after all, expect him to rise above his own times and his own culture. Kierkegaard has also given no indication whatsoever that he would be prepared to consider such an option. Still, Kierkegaard's radical insight about the tremors of possibility arising within the shattered self and their intensification in the pain consciousness of being a shattered self in need of reconstitution, regrounding, and rebirth, have a meaning and a validity even for others who do not think of the process in Christian terms, as both Heidegger and even Jean Paul Sartre demonstrated in their early 20th century non Christian writings that were so indebted to Kierkegaard. Aurelius Augustinus and Soren Kierkegaard are surely very different individuals, from very different times and very different cultures, yet they might each think that the the other has more in common with him than we ourselves might. Their bodies of work are surely very different from each other, as are the forms in which they express their ideas and explorations. And there is a huge difference, after all, between being a bishop of a small community in Hippo Regius in North Africa in the 5th century and being a pietist formed Lutheran of Northern Europe 1400 years later. They are both talented polemicists, they each like a good fight passionate not just in their expression, but in their experiences, whose passions they then mine for all that they're worth. Augustine had more of an active life and more of an outer life than Kierkegaard, who was not in, infrequently cited for having merely lived, and to be rather really written rather than lived. Their private lives differed enormously too. There's a significant difference between their approaches to religious psychology. For Aurelius Augustinus clearly believed the line in the famous play of Terence, uh, Unum Noris Omnis, which is actually the story line from this play, but basically means if you understand one person really well and really deeply, then you understand everybody. Um, now, there's truth in this, but it is not the whole truth of who we are. And Kierkegaard perhaps saw a little bit more than Augustine an individuality in, in the self. But what is more important to each of them, at least, is it, and what they have in common, most importantly, 
is an identical Jesus of Nazareth who assures the pardon of their errors and of their incompleteness while on their combined spiritual slash physical journey. Both think of the human condition in terms of original sin, which Augustine took, of course, a central role in formulating. But ultimately, both share an interest in the existential meaning of the doctrine more than in the, simply the literal narrative of Adam and Eve. Both must see the human condition as privative, a term made current by Augustine who articulated an explanation of evil, not as an opposing subject, substance to the good, but rather as privative, that is, an absence of good. This, of course, was Augustine's famous answer to the problem of good and evil that was so central to the Manichaeans among whom he had spent 11 years as a younger man. It's a pity, perhaps, that they were trapped in original sin as a doctrine, as the historical explanation for the human condition, rather than taking a hint from Irenaeus, Irenaeus of Lyon, who unfortunately does not go far enough with his own insight, but who articulated the human problem not as fall so much as incompleteness. Incompleteness moving toward completeness, as developed, uh, quite interestingly, by the famous Claremont professor of theology, John Hick, in a famous book called Evil and the God of Love. It's a different kind of modern answer to the question of the origin of evil. Okay. So, that's about as much of that I can do in this. Uh, Archer's era leaves the bowstring and has no rest, where it reaches the target. 
So the human being is created by God, with God, as his aim, and cannot find rest before he finds rest in God. Yeah, so I mean, presumably you're to your point, presumably you did read it. I think that's an obvious. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine that they didn't, but right. what makes me think of it's my like to go find out what they actually were reading in, in theology that the university cultivated back in the 1850s. Like, so maybe the confessions were not the kind of popular work that we, and I'm sure it's had its ups and downs throughout history, but maybe it's not the popular work that we, that we think it is. Maybe it didn't resonate with the university. I don't know. Right. I just don't know. So, I mean, as you know, if you're here to really watch this possibility, he actually liked it very much, and that's why he didn't talk about it. I mean, some of his favorite writers are the ones that he only cites three or four times in the entire book. I mean, uh, as we know, you know, he'll say, this is this wise old, you know, prophetic figure, and so on, and kind of backs his poetic about these people have like two comments in the entire book. So it's an interesting kind of feature. Of his yeah, life. if he if he didn't read the confessions, I mean, I still find it hard to imagine that he that he didn't. It's almost unimaginable that lines like that and the confessions right. were not signed in the sermons that have been heard to it to right. and so forth, but it would have been familiar with it. Right. To him. Yeah, so my question. Now you open it. <laughs> right. The selfie. Yes. Right? So can we analyze the selfie in terms of despair? You know, in terms of That sounds like a lecture topic for you. Yeah, me. right. <laughs> well that's what I want you to give me an answer. Because well, I, I think it's a very interesting idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a great, it was a great opening, but then sort of the combination. I don't know if anything else in there. Well, I, I think I originally proposed to Barbara Hillersley uh, to talk about the confessions as a huge selfie. <laughs> uh, which may sound good as a joke, which we could usually carry out. <laughs> because it is a huge selfie. Although it's certainly a very complicated self-presentation. You know, uh, uh, so your question is what? Well, I don't know. I, you know, just, well, I mean, it, 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 yeah. it, it leads to the kind of Kierkegaardian and Heideggerian comment about the, the times and, and the, the, the hollowing out of words that were once important, such that sometimes we don't know what they mean anymore. One, one of the things that has really astonished me in a, in a course evaluation a, a couple of years ago, in a course that I taught on, on the self, was a student writing in, until I took this course, I never realized I had a self. And I said, what? <laughs> You know, what did this what did this mean? This can't mean what it, what it says. You know, and, and if so, good heavens, what kind of an age are we living in? You know, or, or what kind of a culture has this person come out of? You know, I mean I didn't get a chance to follow up on that. But, uh, but so it's, it's become a hollow word, you know, it's, uh, the externalization of life uh, becomes stronger and stronger as, as time goes on and the, the kind of the idea that there really is no such thing as, as in your life to be paid attention to is a terribly dangerous modern notion, you know, which, which, which leads to really unhappy, disturbed people who, who find no peace because they don't come to terms with themselves internally. You know, I mean, uh, I mean, we all know that the gymnasia at modern universities are visited far more often than the chapel. You know, not, not that either gymnasia or the, they're not the only places where athletics can take place, and chapels are not the only place where religious life can take place, but you know, there's, there's something to that. Um, as if you know, people will go there for external rituals, and you know, do, do, do people have any more hopes that people have an inner sense or something? Well, I suspect a lot of people do, but but but, but things things have changed, and uh, it's it's worrisome. I mean, one hopes that at the worst it's simply a, a period of time that we're going through, and that, that there'll be a change. But everybody's some period of control, you know. Uh, that's a, probably it's, in fact it's the only people that's always a kind of strange cultural observation because one thinks that the culture that one is born into uh, is the way culture has always been. You know, and, and it isn't the case. You know, it, it wasn't the same way 40 years ago and it won't be the same case 40 or 50 years from now. I mean, uh, you too, when you become grandparents, will be considered out of it by your children and grandchildren. You know, it's just, just the way it's always been. Uh, something to look for. Well, it's not, it's, you're going to have fun with it too. So, um, yeah, what, what, uh, this, I mean, this interesting name of the selfie, I mean, the, lots of love jokes about it. Uh, I was on a, a, a Mayan travel tour in, in Guatemala in, in July, and you know, half the, I mean, first of all, nowadays everybody travels with a camera, and so that you know, you're, you're really just a photographer, you have to look at all the different kinds of cameras. 
Uh, but the, the, they were, there was many, most people were taking more pictures of themselves with the ruins than they were taking pictures of the ruins. You know, and then taking selfies with each other. I mean, these were middle-aged people. And I just thought, wow, you know, what, what, what a change this is. And I'm wondering, like, what, what, does, what does this represent about our culture? You know, perhaps it's a response to the fact that people expect them to send pictures of themselves. I prided myself on that being a single picture that I took or that anyone took. And just knowing that doesn't surprise me at all. But, uh, but that, there, there we are. You know, uh, you know, do we have a notion? Is ourselves simply our hour of the world? You know, also the, the physical fitness of the cult of our age, which, which is in many ways very good because it's making people healthier. Uh, but you know, people get carried away with it and they only develop their outer self. Self. There's a poverty, and not just a theoretical poverty, but Augustine and Hebrew is, is a poverty of experience. You're missing something in your own experience, and that's the, that's the real challenge. Isn't that a picture like a thousand years ago? That's only for people who like to talk a lot. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I read it not as a objective, balanced definition of the self, but much more along the lines of what Kierkegaard thinks he's doing and wants to do, which is to be a corrective. Yeah. You know, something's gotten out of balance. He talks about himself often as the pinch of salt. You know, he's got to add something to it. And so he wants to stress something that other people aren't stressing. He's not suggesting that what he's stressing is the only thing that there is. But, but that's something that needs to be paid attention to. And what he's talking about in that definition is it's a self-relationship and relationship to the constituting power, you know, which is the reaching into God, which he thinks at his age is not paying any attention to, or he's paying increasingly less attention to. But uh, that has led people to sometimes think that Kierkegaard is solipsistic, that he's just introverted, that he has no interest in society, none of which is, none of which is true. You know, and he's given plenty of indications elsewhere about his concern, but he was, he was not politically enlightened or politically progressive. Uh, but, but, but he is concerned about society. And he, he would probably put it in his time that the building blocks of a good society are good individuals, are, are healthy, well balanced, well grounded individuals. And you know, that's not the full truth of the matter, but there's truth in that. So. Well, does that definition reflect something that's maybe not the norm or something that's just a problem? Well, I mean, if you're talking about that definition, uh, well, that, that if, if you mean mythology in, in, in the negative sense, because the world has negative connotations, you know, no, I mean, that, you know, what is the self to self as a relation that relates itself to its own self? I mean, he's talking about the importance of, of self relationship, of relating to oneself. And how does one relate to oneself? One relates to oneself in one's interior life and in the relationship to, to the transcendent, to God. Now, uh, is that normative? Yes, but it's not complete. Right. And, and it can appear to be complete, where I think that's, that's a mistaken mistake interpretation. But I think, and you know, the spirit of his writings, he, he makes fun all the time of people who try to give complete, uh, objective answers. There's no interest in such things. Yeah, Yeah, I just wanted to ask this place of salt um, would you agree that um, some similarity perhaps between Augustine and Kierkegaard is the kind of faithfulness? Mm -hmm. um, well, I remember uh, reading in uh, Saint Augustine's letter that you know that Father Roman is a very, very dynamic person. Mm -hmm. But also, a very interesting to the degree mm -hmm. that it seems to be. Uh, 
um, and who would that be? Who would that be compared to the notion of uh, accepted personality in, in uh, uh, Austin? Not only in Germany, but also in Austin. Yeah, I missed it. Probably, yeah. probably accepted personal method. Probably yeah. mental exercise. Yeah. Uh, not only in Germany, but The cube that makes fun of uh, exaltation in the most terms, of course, but it, it, it sees the danger of it with, with the intellectuals of his time, which he regards as a, another form of aestheticism. It, it's not serious. Mm -hmm. you know, um, he's, of course, very playful. Um, and uh, he's, I mean, irony, the name of his first book is Opera Dissertation. And it, it runs through some, some of the things that are actually quite funny. You get to a book like Sickness Unto Death. It's so overly serious in appearance that one begins to suspect there's a joke going on here. And the, the, the way that, well, the, the structure of it indicates a bit of a joke. He, he, uh, he'll, he'll divide a book for the book from the book the concept of anxiety, the concept of dread, where he'll talk about a problem. There's, a subjective pro there's an objective problem and a subjective problem. And the objective problem gets six pages, the subjective problem gets 100. He structurally is a joke. He's telling us something. In the book, The Sickness Unto Death, uh, he gives a kind of uh, thoroughgoing theoretical analysis of forms of despair, but at times that, that too seems to be a joke. There is the despair of finitude versus the despair of infinitude, the despair of possibility versus the despair of necessity, and so forth. And you can get really pulled into that until you're like, wait a minute. Why is he talking this way? He's only talking this way because these are dialectical categories that a dialectician expects to find in a book like this. And I don't, and you don't think he's taking it seriously. I think he's making fun. Because the, the, the forms that he takes fun of in the end, they really seem to be forms of the same thing. You know, they're just a big fuss made over a slightly different angle of looking. So I, I think there is a playfulness going on there. That's what's up for Augustine. Yeah, well, I mean, Augustine is, yeah, it's, 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 and then, of course, they're both, you know, when they want to be, they can be you know, terribly passionate writers. And, um, and in, in, well, coming from their own experience as well. And uh, give their enemies no quarter, their intellectual enemies. I mean, the, 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 one of the redeeming things about Augustine is he at least. Uh, uh, Writes the uh, he's, he's sort of his correctives, you know, to, uh, something here does it does. You know. um, not that you know, the problem now is corrective, as some people think it might be, but nonetheless, it's a uh, rather unique sort of thing in, in, in the history of literature. You know, and, uh, and the retractions, the retractions. Yes. Kierkegaard is reacting much more to Hegelian than to Hegel. You know, uh, Hegelianism was the, the fad, and his, uh, his tutor, and eventually the professor of theology, Martinson, who had come back from Germany, as a, as a, was doing Hegelian theology, which was all the rage, and he was very much against this. Professor Martinson eventually became Bishop Martinson, and that really did it for him. Uh, so so he, he's, he mocks Hegelianism. And, talks about uh, the, the problem of people who build systems. He talks about the system as a great thing. There are people who build great castles and then there was a lot outside. And he thinks this is basically what Hegel did. That you know, it's a huge intellectual accomplishment, uh, but it's actually not worth anything. It's just, it's just a sandcastle of, of philosophy. You know, it, it doesn't know what it is. There's a very interesting construction on the beach in the afternoon, uh, but that's about it. It doesn't really represent reality. 
It's always told that uh, back when as a still a relatively young man, he, he went to Berlin in 1841 and went to the, the lectures of Schelling. Uh, Schelling had been called to the former chair occupied by Hegel at the University of Berlin uh, with the charge from the Russian king to quote unquote root out the dragon tooth of Hegelian pantheism. How's that for a professorial appointment? <laughs> to, to pull out the dragon tooth of Hegelian pantheism. And, and Kierkegaard was in this famous lecture series where Engels was present, the Kuhling, the Burkhardt, and all those different people with whom he apparently never spoke. That's been, I think that's a mistake. Yeah, but I've seen that written. It was Engels, and it's the person who wrote that book. Engels was there. And if I'm wrong, you know, please correct me because I, yeah, uh, because I believe it was angry. In any case, um, and uh, in the opening lecture of uh, Schelling, uh, Schelling mentions the word existence. You know, and Kierkegaard apparently you know, breathed a huge sigh of relief and, and goes home and writes something you know, to the effect of, uh, uh, you know, for the biblical. Laid in my womb left for joy. You know, when I heard the word existence finally mentioned, it's such a relief from, 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 from the philosophy of the time, which is just an abstract mental game that has nothing to do with what's real. You know, and that's his criticism of, of the Hegelians in, in, in Denmark. And that, I, that, that's not exactly, a, that would not be a totally a fair criticism of Hegel, who, who did have an existential sense and who did have a real life and who really was a terribly, terribly decent person. In fact, he's probably a better neighbor than someone like you. Know. Hegel, Hegel acknowledged and supported his own religion as a child, which would have been pretty rare back in, in the late 1800s. You know, he was a really decent, normal person. You know, but you know, certainly, uh, Hegel, his, his, his writing is certainly a mind trip, you know, which, which, you know, which, which can be fun if you like that sort of thing. It could be maddening if you really look at it a different way. I, I find it fun myself. And he would have no trouble uh, acknowledging Hegel you know, as, as the greatest thinker in, in the history of the world. You know, uh, but yeah, but, but what is it to be the greatest thinker in the history of the world? It's much less than being a farmer who's got a seat on the ground and who's in touch with what's real. You know, for, for, you know, so he's mocking intellectuals all the time. And so I said, the intellectual life is not any kind of met, so fact and morally superior life. Just write fancy books and, and uh, papers and things that impress all his scholars. So he, he begins the book, The Sickness Unto Death. The point about despair is not so much to understand it, but to do something about it. So that, that's, that's what he wants to emphasize. That's why he says a, a student would like this, and probably not a theology professor. Because a theology professor would like to catalog everything and then categorize everything and get into all the nuances and forget about the point, which is to do something. Curious if the students get anything out of this besides a check off point for your, <laughs> your self course. I talked to some of the students beforehand. Does it look easily sort of go into you know, arcane literacy and, and, and footnotes? Which, which at a certain point could be great fun. <laughs> Irenaeus in Wikipedia, uh, and that'll lead you on to other things, but uh, there's a different take on that. So, in fact, it's interesting how they write a whole book on interpretations of the, uh, the fall in early Christianity. It's a very, very rich in the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the 
we perfectly, but we sort of adopt the original sin that's, that's currently taken by the Orthodox Catholics and Orthodox Protestants, uh, crystallized at a certain point. Augustine played a big role in that. He doesn't, he's not the origin of it by any means. And there were a lot of, a number of alternative uh, takes on that. Athanasius is one of those kind of alternative alternatives. <laughs> It's quite interesting. Maybe that's all for practical people. The pointy headed philosophers is quite intellectual fun. Yeah. Um, so, this definition of the self as an intellectual intellection, an intellectual story, would that be? Influenced by late 18th and 19th century subject object relations in German philosophy? Because weren't there some changes in that? I think this comes in for um, the idea of, of um, representing objects as a relationship instead of. Uh, yes, um, he's, he's really reacting to the, the sort of uh, the cult of science and the cult of objectivity, you know, that we can be objective. Be objective about ourselves. You know, he uh, has a famous quote from him in a book called Concluding Scientific Postscript, in which he says, Subjectivity is the truth. You know, that's, taken out of context, that can be misread to think that he's saying that only subjectivity is true and there's no such thing, no value to any kind of objective truth. Once again, he's trying to be a corrective. He's trying to say, in a, in a time of when objectivity is so prized and privileged, Subjectivity, which has something to say, is being neglected. You know, and uh, uh, it's, it's really important to pay attention to one's subjectivity, also to, uh, and not to take it overly seriously as well, which he thinks the Romantics do. You know, it's a sort of celebration of feeling. You, know, you, know, you want to understand love, the best thing that can happen to you is to get dumped by your girlfriend. Then you get agonized, you see, and then, 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 you, then you can learn something. Well, you know, if that happens to you, you can learn something. It's hardly to be recommended. <laughs> Not the kind of thing one wants to go for, one doesn't have to. Uh, but but the, the, the romantics would, uh, would always seek for those kind of uh, experiences and, you know, and, and, and be the kind of suffering poets and so forth. And he, uh, he really turned his vicious now on that model. So his, uh, so his emphasis on the, the subject is, is something is, is because he thinks it's neglected. And, uh, in the 19th century, uh, and you know, it, it is a reaction to to themes not just in philosophy but in, in German culture. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, of course, it's, it's obvious in, in our higher awareness, the more secularized version of the sort of existential philosophy. But um, and I'm not. I'm not He certainly, he certainly went through a period of searching as a, as a young man. And he had his, what he describes and exaggerates as his wayward years. Uh, as I think Augusta also exaggerates so frankly as well. But you know, there, there were some of them. Um, he, uh, he, he, he does have a point then of, uh, of religious conversion. And uh, um, when, when he's in his, uh, he's in his late 20s. And, and 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 really follows it in some sense a very very strict orthodox line, but which for him is existential. I mean, it's just not just you know, signing your name to some kind of you know, creed or something. But for him, this, this was true. This was real. This was experience. And it's, it's like it's the emphasis on experiential Christianity that really binds him and, and Augustine closely together. It's it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not just. Doctrines and creeds and statements and so forth. It's what you, if you, 
The Q grammar is not interested, for example, in proofs to the, the existence of God. You, know, you either experience God in your life or you don't. And you'd say the experience of the divine is there. Uh, he would be pointed as how it would be recognized. And if you want to say, no, I don't have any such experience, he'd find that hard to believe, but he'd probably say, there's nothing I can do for you. you, know, uh, it, it's, you know, I'm not going to give you Ansel's proofs or, or somebody else's to, to try and bring you around intellectually. That, that stuff doesn't matter. I see the eyes of the servant here regarding the guardian. Well, I was going to say, well, <laughs> to that point, I don't know if I can really follow the question, but to that point, he does have this sort of towards the end of his authorship where he starts emphasizing the Inisatio Christi and he says no one who imitates Christ doubts the existence of God. So even in that regard, he kind of shifts the emphasis on obedience to the will of God uh, rather than constructing a kind of intellectual demonstration of God's existence so that you might obey and believe. It's rather the other way around. It's, it's obey and then you will believe in a sense. Um, so, was your question about the uh, the existence of God? Was that I don't know if there's a true dichotomy? Yeah, but there's a difference between sort of the more scriptural subjectivity um, and whether you. So, if, if there's slightly more depth about this, so there's like um, a subjectivity is a more central, like universal idea that sort of provisions um, what's a subject. Yes, yeah, it's complicated, but I don't know about it more either way, you know, and, and certainly you don't want to... There are certain that. key Christian tenets that are experiential, I mean, sin and forgiveness and grace that mean the essential ones. For him, those are experiential. You know, I mean, certain kinds of statements in the, you know, the Nicene Creed and that, well, those are, you know, one doesn't experience those things, but you know, he, he would certainly subscribe to them for any intellectual sense. But you would, you would you give me the impression that have you read a lot of Heidegger? Um, well, it's just being time is quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, one of your own professors here, uh, Jack Caputo, you know, I remember once having lunch with him and we were commenting about how much Heidegger stole from Kierkegaard, and he basically said that he taught a course once in which he told the students on the first day that. Uh, the book Being in Time has made in Denmark stand on every page. You know, and, and it's not a god. He said he's retreated really from that more extreme statement of it. But, but, but there's a lot of truth in that. And in many ways, Heidegger is a, is a highly secularized form of Kierkegaard. I also believe that uh, Heidegger, in some ways, makes Kierkegaard, is, is a good interpreter of Kierkegaard, although Heidegger might not agree with that. But um, Heidegger makes clearer what Kierkegaard means by. Anxiety and uh, and I think about categories. You know, I think Heidegger is improving on it. Uh, back to the time, uh, Vincent, 